Eve is in an unhappy marriage. She has thought about leaving her husband many times, but lacks the courage to do so until her friend Fiona arrives on the scene. Scene 12, the sun is rising. Eve is wide awake while her husband is snoring away. She rises and looks out of the window to find Fiona walking up to her vehicle. Eve hurriedly gets dressed and discreetly goes out to meet Fiona. Fiona appears very excited. Ready? Yes, uh, what about my clothes? Where we're going, we'll have plenty. I thought you said 5.30. So we're a bit early. Come on then, we haven't gotten long. I was really worried that John was gonna wake up, but he didn't move a muscle. I gave them all a lovely relaxing tonic. Oh, how relaxing. Call it intuitive action. You mean you poisoned them? No, not everyone. Oh my God. It's just a bit of fun. Oh, Fiona, you promised you wouldn't do that. I said I would be as creative as possible. And I think given the circumstances, I have done an amazing job. I can't believe that you changed the plan without consulting me. You are a nervous wreck. There was no need to consult with you. Well, still. Our new identifications are in the glove compartment. Right. At this hour, the road should be clear. We'll get to the port in no time. Come on, jump in. Eve opens the passenger door, but is reluctant to jump into the car. Fiona looks at her and pulls an odd face. Surely you'd be excited by now. All those awkward tensions are officially over for you. Fiona, what if John comes after me in France? Who said we were going to France? What do you mean? Don't worry your pretty little head about it. Where are we going then? We are meeting a friend of mine. I need to pick up some papers. What for? It'll be a good stranglehold over John and his business. But I thought I was going to leave. I was leaving to be free from all this anxiety and frustration. Remember what I said? You said a lot of things. You can't just step out of another person's life without consequence. Whether you like it or not, you will have to face the music. Therefore, we need to take precautions and be a step ahead of John. Right, and after you pick up these papers, are we going to France? Eventually, we might end up in France. Might? Eve, have a little faith, will you? I'm relieving you of your abominable duties as Mrs. Beltisham, and I've gotten rid of Sebastian for you. What more do you want? What have you done to Sebastian? I will tell you the story later. Fiona. Let's just say he'll be sleeping for a long while. You killed him? I didn't ask you to do that. I didn't kill him. Harold did. What? I have happily sought my revenge thanks to you, Eve. Oh, dear God, you framed Harold. Isn't that wonderful? My ex-husband gets the blame and I delightfully laugh my head off. The bastard deserves it. John is going to be so distraught. Does it really matter? Besides, you said that sex with John was like hanging off of a door handle. I only asked you to put them to sleep long enough so that we could get away. Dessert was definitely delicious for some. Oh, I think I feel sick. Stop with this nonsense. We should be celebrating your newfound freedom. You should have checked with me. So that you could stop me? I would have thought of something else. Eve, stop backpedaling. Otherwise, your past will always take precedence. I know I've been looking forward to this moment for a while now, but... But nothing. The point is, you did it. You're a free person now. No more boring Deltishums to live with. No more Sebastian being a nuisance to you and trying to force himself on you. And above all, we'll get to enjoy my divorce settlement in style. It's going to be terrific. Just you wait and see. What about Alice? What about your fucking mother-in-law? What have you done to her? I left her slumped over a table. And Vanessa? Who gives a shit? I didn't realize that you were planning so much. You said you wanted them all to go to hell. Your mental health was suffering, so I thought I would finish the job properly without burdening you. At the time, it, it felt like that, but... You I had your chance, and you chickened out. Thank God I turned up. I guess you're right. It's finally over. You got your life back. Will you please fucking cheer up? 
As Fiona laughs at her, she jumps into her vehicle. Eve forces a smile and joins her. End of scene. Top Seed and the Poor Seedlings, a comedy. The setting is a private tennis court. Uh, <coughs> Advantage, the Supremo. Match point. Don't let me ace the final serve, Giovanni. Go out in style. Try for a spectacular robe. <laughs> Game set and match. Go fix the drinks. I'll join you in a minute. Oh, don't feel bad. You hit that last shot out of the park. You should take a baseball. <laughs> Excuse me, senora, over there on the pile of dirt. Would you mind? Grazie. I haven't touched a tennis ball in decades. It's a lot harder than I remember. You're smudging it. Oh dear, how inconsiderate of me. Va bene, I am Franco, Franco Romani. Am I supposed to recognize the name? If you follow sports. I don't. I'm Maureen Carter, not widely known, beyond local charities. We just moved in. I'm well aware. Concrete mixers have been heralding your arrival for weeks. I hope the noise was not too bad. I suppressed an urge to record the decibel level. You have got your peace and quiet back now. Have I? Yes, the work is all finito. We christened the court this morning. I heard the whole hullabaloo. Tennis is much louder than I thought. Rackets do not come with silencers. I expected the odd fuck, but not the constant running commentary. Just keeping score. I play chess. We don't feel the need to announce every move with a grunt. It is easy to make no sound when you expend no energy. I get my exercise from gardening. Let's see how fit you are. Can you manage to throw the, back, the ball back over? I wonder. Andiamo. The fence, it is not that high. This eyesore has one job, and it's already failed on the first morning. We played hundreds of strokes. A single ball escaped. Well, how often do you intend to use the court? Every day. A professional needs regular practice. So over the next decade, we're facing potentially thousands of breaches? Assuming I survived that long next door to you? <gasps> yeah, I beg your pardon. Mi dispiace, Maureen. Just throw the ball back. No, I refuse to condone vandalism. What? The pile of dirt where this landed is actually a flower bed. I see no color. The seedlings are yet to bloom. They're at a very delicate stage, vulnerable to aerial bombardment. Davvero? This is technically a missile. I'm confiscating it as evidence. I have other balls, you will see. Is that a threat? Let us both calm down. I am willing to be a good neighbor. How? I will make the fence twice as high. No! I hate the sight of this monstrosity as it is. An extension would be unbearable. And I thought you were concerned for your sprouts. There's another solution. Let us hear it. Move the court. What? You have a large lawn on the far side of the house. Install the court there. Do not be ridiculous. You clearly have the money. It's important for neighbors to be considerate, don't you agree? One moment. 
What is this? A leaf from your tree? An oak, deciduous. Grandio, wet leaves are a slip hazard. Well, that tree, the wind blows them everywhere. That tree must have thousands. I cannot risk injury. Then move the court. No, chop the tree. Never. I could break my leg. Not if you take my advice. A wire fence offers no protection. Leaves can fly through. You are right, Maureen. I will build a wall, solid brick. That would be hideous. Besides, leaves would drift over the top. True, I will make the wall four times higher. <gasps> oh, dear Lord, no. Mil gracias. <laughs> it is so nice to have a helpful neighbor. <laughs> In the play. Important safety information. Contact your doctor immediately if you experience uncontrollable movements of the face, eyelids, tongue, mouth, neck, arms, hands, or legs, or severe or persistent nausea or vomiting, an irregular heartbeat, or fluttering of the chest uh, may cause dizziness or drowsiness. So use caution when driving, operating machinery, or performing other hazardous activities. <laughs> yeah, right. <clears throat> and don't say we didn't warn you when you get pulled over. Tell your health care provider if you experience a lack of menstrual periods or leaking or enlarged breasts or impotence. Less serious side effects may include choking or trouble swallowing, bloating, belching, sharding, sleep problems, or weight gain, nausea, vomiting, tiredness, excessive saliva or drooling, blurred vision, stroke can lead to death, If any of these effects persist or worsen, tell your doctor or pharmacist immediately. Symptoms may also include feeling very thirsty, feeling very hungry, feeling weak or tired, feeling sick to your stomach, feeling confused or noticing that your breath smells foul. Additional side effects include accidental bowel leakage, which means the inability to control the passage of stool or gas. Some people have mild trouble holding gas, while others have severe trouble holding stool. Stop using if you have trouble holding one or the other or both. In the event that this should occur, 
talk to your health care provider if you experience a yeast infection, itching, swelling, eczema, bumps, spots, blisters, body lice, Grover's disease, prigonodularis, pruritus, pinworms, bullus pemphigoid, dermatitis, herpetiformis, crab disease, scabies, or a foul-smelling discharge from a reproductive organ. This discharge may be lumpy or smell like unrefrigerated large curd, pineapple cottage cheese. In certain uncircumcised men, avoid eating persimmons. And please do not eat prunes or drink prune juice, which can often result in sharding, bad sharding, especially on long bus rides. I may cause fever, stiff muscles, confusion, sweating, fast or uneven heartbeats, jerky muscle movements, sudden numbness, sores in your mouth and throat, memory loss, priapism, Stevens-Johnson syndrome, peeling skin, shooting pains, akathisia, onycholysis, bloating followed by flatulence, unwanted hair growth, feeling like you might pass out, feeling like you can't sleep, feeling like you can't stay awake, jaundice, tremors, mask-like expression of the face, a decrease in white blood cells, an increase in red blood cells, unusual dreams, mania, anxiety, unusual anxiety. What the fuck does that mean? Is there usual anxiety? Tell your health care provider about bleeding from the gums and other unusual bleeding. Now, what the fuck does that mean? Is there usual bleeding? Vomit that looks like coffee grounds. Seeing halos around lights. Being more talkative than usual. Not being able to speak. Taking more than the recommended dose may cause hallucinations or feelings of standing outside your body. For the sake of family members, friends, and the general public, please make sure you are properly dressed when standing outside your body. Tell your doctor if you're pregnant, planning to become pregnant, or even remotely enjoy being around children. Heart attack, stroke, or aphasia may occur. If you were born in, lived in, or traveled to countries where certain fungal infections are common, be sure to contact your travel agent. May cause serious side effects, including infections caused by viruses and fungi, clay-colored bowel movements, tuberculosis. <laughs> That's right, TB. may cause a potentially rare brain condition which you shouldn't know from. 
This is not a complete list of the possible side effects for this programmed DEATH-1 inhibitor. If you notice other effects not listed above, such as scalp dissecting, cellulitis, fish odor syndrome, and necrotizing fasciitis, a.k.a. flesh-eating bacteria. Fatal familia insomnia, which means that you can't sleep even after watching extra innings of West Coast baseball game. This condition is untreatable. And over the course of a few weeks, your insomnia leads to phobias and panic attacks. You start hallucinating, and you are unable to eat, and you become completely and totally useless. And oh, by the way, this is a slow, drawn-out death with no cure. Should this occur, please contact your Human Resource Department or Rent Management Office in order to file a complaint. In the rare event of an erection lasting more than four hours, Seek immediate medical attention to avoid long-term injury. And don't forget, ask your doctor whether this drug is right for you. Second Chance, Exterior Night, City Street. Detective Charles Turbulin sta steps out of his car. He draws his jacket closer to his neck and walks up to an alley. Why am I doing this again? I didn't have to take this one. I could have just gone home. Why a cop? I could have been a gardener or an insurance salesman. Why couldn't I have been an insurance salesman? My father sold insurance. I, I would have been a natural after all. Insurance salesmen protect and serve, don't they? As he approaches the entrance to the alley, he pauses to observe the surrounding area. It is quiet. No other cars, no other people move through the streets. He stares for a moment at the traffic light on the corner as it changed from green to yellow, then to red. He stands lost in thought as the light continues to regulate the empty street. He is startled out of his trance when at one point the traffic light seems to change from red to yellow and then green. It happens so quickly he thinks he's only imagined it. His attention is drawn away from the traffic light from the voices coming from the alley. He enters the alley. It is dark and damp from the cold night air that clings to the brick walls. The walls are bathed in the ambient flashes of the photographer's camera. Compared to the street, the alley brims with activity as people mill about going through their tasks. A commotion of life except for the motionless body that is face down on the pavement. Charles moves closer to the body and scans the pavement around the body. He looks around the alley. It is typical for that part of the city. Just a dead end where, he's, where the stores hide their waste. What's up, Chuck? No. Oh. Hey, Benjamin. Detective Benjamin Dial was a comfortable man whose only goal in life was to retire quietly with little effort as possible. 
He has reached the point in his career where he is always slightly disheveled, balding, and softly overweight. Charles knew that Detective Benjamin Dial did not like being called Benjamin. He preferred Benny. But then again, Charles did not like being called Chuck. Why are you out here tonight, Chuck? I missed your sour face, Benjamin. You know, you, you should turn that thing off. Hey. It ain't that bad. Besides, it's Friday night. I always wear it on Friday night. Uh, what's the story? Oh, you mean the body? A stabbing? Possible robbery. Robbery. Nothing special. I'm sure. If he could talk, he would disagree with you. Yeah, you know what I mean. In this part of town. Yeah, I guess I know what you mean. Well, if you got it under control, I was headed home anyway. Charles turns to walk back down the alley. Benjamin moves quickly towards him. Uh, about that, Ch uh, uh, Charles, uh, how about you take this one? Not tonight, Benjamin. You've got this one. I need to get some sleep. I just finished the Clock Street report, uh, the Clock Street robbery report. I'm done for the night. Benjamin catches hold of Charles' sleeve as Charles turns away. Yeah, I know how you feel, but, but this is a cold case in the makings. Just a bunch of paperwork and phone calls. And you know I ain't no good making those phone calls to family. Sorry, Benjamin. I, I'm just too tired. Yeah, th thanks, Chuck. Oh, you won. I I'll make the call. Hell, I don't even know what time it is. it's in uh, Iowa. Why Iowa? Well, that's where the poor sap's from. And I can't remember if they're ahead of us or behind us. You know, you know what time it is in Iowa? Ahead of us, Benny. W well, they would be if they change time. I, I'm not sure if they do the savings time or not. Charles moves past Benny. He looks down the alley to the body. From Iowa? So says his driver's license. What do you mean they don't change time? Why wouldn't Iowa change time? Uh, not every state changes for daylight savings time. Benny, obviously distracted by this information, steps closer to Charles. You mean there are others? Are you sure about that? Well, like Arizona, and I think there may be two other states, but I'm not sure. Iowa may be one of them. What's his name, Benny? Well, I don't get it. How do people know what time it is? I, if not everyone uses the same time. Charles only half listens to Benny. His attention was on the body, and he is whirls trails from his mouth almost unconsciously. Well, no, Benny. I, I guess it's because time does not really exist. What? What do you mean, time don't exist? Charles paces toward the body and back to Benny. He notices Benny is staring blankly at him, but disregards the look. Any ID? Oh, no, Ch Chuck. Th this ain't one of those Chuck statements you make and don't explain. What, do you, what the hell you mean, time don't exist? Charles has stopped his pacing, realizing that Benny is not going to let his statement slide this time. It's not real, Benny. It's just an arbitrary unit of measurement, man-made, to give us all some degree of standards. It does not really exist, at least not as a substance. It, it only exists out of necessity as a means to regulate our lives. Are you crazy? I, I gotta watch it disagrees with you. Look. There goes a second. That's real. Man-made, Benny. I have a watch also, and I bet it does not have the same time as yours. Benny grabs Charles' arm to see the time. He stares at it for a few seconds as he waits for a second or two to tick away. Yeah, well, yours is running fast, so. Exactly, Benny. If time were real, we would both have the exact same time. If it was real, we could be both be correct. How could... If it was real, how could we both be correct if we have different times? It, it, it's all arbitrary. Well, just cause your ticker's broken don't mean it ain't real. Everybody needs to know when to be somewhere, when they need to show up, and everybody's got to use the same time or else, how else could you travel, like travel across the country and be on time? I don't know, Benny, it's all relative. What's his name, Benny? Yeah, you know, it, it would be a big problem for my relative. Some cousin or uncle ask you to meet you somewhere at nine and, and you show up at what do you think is nine, but you're three hours late or, or you're early and you're standing around waiting, getting angry because you think the other guy's late. It's messed up. Benjamin, 
What's this guy's name? Okay, okay, just a minute. Then he searches through his pockets and pulls out the victim's driver's license. It's Jules Vernon. It's Vernon Jules, isn't it? Then he looks at the driver's license. Oh, yeah, you're, you're right. How'd you know? Charles steps slowly back towards the body just as the examiner turns it over. The body's face hidden at first in the darkness is revealed as the flashes from the cameras expose its features. The abrupt moments of lightness and dark make Charles shiver as the examiners lift the body and move it to the black body bag. Charles notices a small object as it falls from the body. He bends down, pulls out a handkerchief from his pocket to pick it up. What is it? Charles stands up and holds the object toward the light. <laughs> Matches. Looks like they're from the night stop. Yeah, it's across the street. Charles walks out toward the street. He stands staring at the bar across the street. Is that O'Malley's place? It used to be. He sold it to Morgan about two years ago. Charles stands at the edge of the alley, his attention fixed on the bar and then on the traffic light on the corner. He's wondering if the traffic light would go in reverse order again. He stares at it, giving himself enough time for the light to cycle three times, but it does not reverse its order. He wonders if he had ever, if it had ever changed the cycle, or maybe he had just been tired and imagined it. He turns away from the street and motions for Benny to hand him the driver's license. Okay, Benny, I'll take the case. I'll make the call. You can go home if you want. Benny is about to hand over the license, but Coral's back. Oh, yeah? Why would they change your heart, Chuck? Don't worry about it, Benjamin. Just give me the license. You wanted to go home, didn't you? What's this guy? Someone famous? Someone important? You got some kind of promotional angle here? It's nothing. I met him before. You mean he was a friend? How come you didn't say anything before? No, Benjamin. Not a friend. No one famous. Just some... Big, poor schmo came into the office, into the precinct. I don't remember him. I don't remember him being in the precinct. Kind of looks like a politician. You sure ain't some bigwig from the Congress or something? No, Benjamin, he isn't. He was an insurance salesman. Insurance salesman? How do you know that? He was in our precinct yesterday. You don't remember him because you were in a hurry to get out and you schlepped him off on me. If you had given him some time, you would have remembered him. You would have remembered he was looking for his daughter. Then he stares as the body is wheeled out of the alley. Hey, I remember. That was the guy who was looking for somebody. Damn strange small world, huh? Charles steps out of the alley and onto the sidewalk and watches as a coroner's car, coroner's car drives down the street. Yeah. Some damn strange world, oh, Benny. A man comes to us looking for help. We turn him away. Now he's dead. Damn small world. Well, I sure he's, hope he's insured. Kind of ironic, ironic if he ain't covered. Charles takes another deep <sighs> breath and would have replied, but he's too overwhelmed to point out to Benjamin his lack of social consciousness. Instead, he just turns away and stands outside of the alley, staring down the street at the traffic light. They just keep changing. What's that? The lights keep changing. There's no traffic control, but they keep changing. Green, yellow, red. Well, hell, of course they do. They're on timers. They run all the time. They don't know nothing about what's on the street. Yes, they control traffic even when there is no traffic. They're designed to protect us, but we don't even matter. They just keep changing, even when we're not around. What's your point, Chuck? It's just that I get it now. There is so much crap controlling our lives that we don't even pay attention to it anymore. We have so little control over our lives, and when we're given the opportunity to make a difference, we just let it slip away. Now you lost me. Charles turns to Benny and his lips form a small smile after he sees the confused look on Benny's face. Sorry, Benny, it's just me rambling. It's only that I could have helped this guy, but I didn't. Maybe he'd be alive if I'd helped him. 
Hey, Chuck, you know, you know, you can't do that. This kind of stuff happens and it ain't your fault. And I remember now this guy was looking for his daughter, but she hadn't been missing long enough for us to do anything. You did it by the book. That's what I mean, Benny. I did it by the book. I was just following procedure, but I could have done more. I could have chosen to help him. Instead, I just brushed him off like he didn't matter. Well, what else could you have done? I don't know. Maybe nothing. You got that right. You played by the book. That guy was a hothead. All I know is he needed help and he was worried about his daughter. I had time. I could have helped him. My job was to help him. But I acted like he did not matter. I was given the opportunity to make a difference and I didn't take it. Yeah, well, water under the bridge. Ain't nothing you can do about it now. What you say we call it a night and head out? This ain't no way to spend a Friday night. Charles does not answer. Instead, he crosses the street to the night stop. Benjamin had begun to walk in the other direction and then stops when he realizes Charles is not following him. He turns to find Charles crossing the street. Yeah, your car's up the street. What you doing? Charles you continues going? to walk toward the night stop. I'm going to go play detective. It's a dead end. You get nothing there. I'll tell you what. I'll wait here. Just so I can tell you, told you so. Benjamin watches Charles as he enters the double doors of the night stop and disappears inside. He stands shaking his head, lights a cigarette, leans against the brick wall. He tilts his head up, releases a steady stream of smoke into the air. The lights keep changing. Of course they keep changing. What else are they going to do? I can't believe anyone would name the same helpless little girl, Lorraine Elizabeth. Elizabeth. But as anyone can plainly see, there aren't one of us. There are two. Isn't one of us. Didn't I just say that? And if we were one person, we sure wouldn't repeat each other's words, let alone correct them. Believe me, I know. And isn't one spoiled sister in any family enough? I'm glad I'm not like that. We're not even full sisters. Of course we are. We came out of the same womb within the same nine month gestation cycle, even if you scooted out first. Gestation, smestation. We had different fathers, just the same. That isn't even possible. It is. Don't make me Google it for you again. Heteropaternal, such an ugly word. Another so-called miracle of so-called modern science, I suppose. I'm willing to accept fraternal, though I really think sororal would be more appropriate. Not that we are exactly. Anyway, mother says no. She was very clear about that. Different father, different fathers. Heteropaternal. Get it through your thick skull. As if either of us should believe anything that slut of a mother told us just because she happened to bear me into this world and never stopped boring me since. It's lucky I'm the one that had sex. They were never up to speed on birth control. I wish a mother had been. Abstinence is the most effective form of birth control. <laughs> Until marriage, I know. When all hell breaks loose in the ovaries and the womb further up as if anyone in the right mind would ever marry you. Me with all the beauty and personality. You, with all the drab style choices and beliefs. It's almost inconceivable we could have popped out of the same flesh-sharded easy bake. You have the balls to pretend we have the same father? Neither of those have those. I never understood how boys deal with him. They're be so hard to position inside a tight pair of jeans. But for girls, it would be just anatomically wrong. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Don't knock it if you haven't tried it. I've had loads of balls, even if they were only temporary and adjacent. That's not the kind of thing you let near the sacred temple of your body, especially in such numbers. Rooster on the altar, 
rooster on the altar, as if anybody but a slumlord could keep a building of any kind of the shape. I use the word loosely. You keep your body in. Little as I can stand the sight of you, all glittery and dolled up like Jezebel and full of herself and wanton with the scissors like Delilah. I'd hate it even worse if you were like inside you. Looking out at the world through those beady little eyes, uh, so utterly lacking in curiosity or guile. Believe me, I pray to the Lord above, probably isn't there, to spare me that if I were ever to do such a foolish thing in my life, talking to imaginary sky person. Prayer raises up, blessings tumble down. Sometimes so heavy and hurtling, they seem to pin us in place and crush us. But that's just seeming and harsh trials to bring us to mercy by mysterious walkways. Even you, Elizabeth, if you'd only- Tell you one thing about our heavenly father? on the doubtful outside chance of his existence. That could be a title to address him by. His existence. Pretty snazzy, huh? <laughs> and it would solve in an instant the biggest, most problematic question about the old man in the sky. There or not there? Deal or no deal? To be or not to be? Perchance what dream? I stop my ears against slithery temptation as poureth forth from thy mouth. <laughs> You've got no reason to fear the temptation of my tongue around your ears, so long as you persist in never washing them. That proves there were no more than half sisters, if nothing does. How dare you assail my cleanly ears with suggestions, pure and clear, and stoppeth against <laughs> iniquity as they are? Attuned to music of the heavenly sphere, our earnest salutations wife up to, never failing, not the brain of Balaam's ass, whom the scriptures neglected to mention was female. And far prettier than her forlorn donkey, half sister. Isn't that what really eats away at widow a woo? <laughs> I'll tell you one more thing, and that's not you, about his existence, the here and after contested almighty. If he resembles any earthly father, it's mine, not yours. There is only one father in heaven, and he is ours both. And that goes for earthly fathers, too. Well, how do you account for the split, then? Starting with us and proceeding clean through the whole world and every shard and broken fragment of existence, some of it much more numerous and tiny broken pieces than the two of us. One womb to start out from and all. I was first out of the gate. Not according to the timekeeper. Oh, the doctor, you mean? The attending midwife thought otherwise, and she had a sharper eye. That splits the result of original sin. Though I must say you've added a few improvements and innovations on the original all by your lonesome self and as far the two of us. I'd be a lot more worried if we weren't split than if we, as is obvious, are. Why do you think it worries me so much when we go out among people and they never see more than one of us? Not you, not me, just a weird mix that neither of us would have anything to do with if we met them on the street. <laughs> when was the last time we met anybody on the street? And as for the people we meet here, what do they know? They're all locked up in a loony bin. So we can start the discussion about Eve. So Tasman, was that a continuation from the from the previous script you brought in? Yes, we okay. did the we did the opening scene. Um, was it last year? I can't remember. Sorry. It was, and I read stage directions. Oh. Yes, we did. Yeah, and Eva Marie, it was between Eva Marie and uh, Paul, who kindly uh, played Sebastian. Yes, that was the opening scene. And I thought I'd throw in, I was, I was mulling over whether I should do the next scene. Um, but then I thought, no, I think the end scene sort of really wraps it up. 
um, the state of mind she is in. Um, so eventually Eve did it. What did she do? She ran away from taking responsibility. Um, and she was, as I was discussing in the breakout room uh, with the others, she is in a, in a place where she doesn't want to be that person anymore. And even though she convinces herself within the play, there are scenes where she convinces herself it's, it's really all about her mental health and she convinces herself, I can get out of this, I can get out of this. She, she tries to convince herself on so many occasions that she will stop being this person and free herself from being, being somebody's wife, being around people who remind her of her past and actually move on to be the person she wants to be, whoever that may be. Um, so she, she confides in her friend Fiona. And what Fiona does, being the good friend that she is, she's listened to Eve. She's listened to her friend. And, and within the dialogue, she says, but you said you wanted them all to go to hell. And even though it was a throwaway comment, Fiona thought, okay, I'm going to help with that. I'll help you with that. I'm your friend. I'm going to help you with that. So I suppose you could say that she's a kind of a semi-psychopath. <laughs> or is she a really good friend? Semi? I don't know. <laughs> Or is she a really good friend, you know, because she took care of everything, everything that maybe Eve was playing in her head and like, oh, my God, I hate this person. I wish they would just vanish into thin air or whatever she was going through. Fiona comes onto the scene and thinks, hey, I can really help you with this. And Zev, you, you did really a brilliant job. And so did Eva Marie. Uh, I think she's left now. And Carol. Carol was fab as well. Um, and I think... Towards the end, Eve suddenly realized that dream that she had was becoming a reality as Fiona was saying, okay, I've done this, I've done that for you. Yes, I've gotten rid of your mother-in-law and the others. Now let's just get in the car and go. That's all. And she was just, Fiona was looking for a little bit of appreciation but Eve is like, but what about them? Oh, but what if, John? But what if they find us in France? But what if? What if? And Fiona's like, look, I've done it for you. You know, you're my friend. Your mental health was suffering. I've done it. Get in the car and we'll enjoy our divorce settlement and it will be fine. And you just think, oh, I suppose the question I want everyone to be thinking about, I'm hoping they are, is, did Eve really do the right thing by just walking away like that? But and Fiona, that's the end. Fiona's also motivated because she gets something out of it also. It takes care of one of her problems. Yes. Yes, you're absolutely right. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Because she cannot stand her ex-husband. And there's a line in there that she says the bastard deserves it. So she's framed her husband as well. So, yeah. So, so, and, and she's so happy about it. You know, yeah. I would never, I, I wouldn't know where to begin to frame someone. I mean, on paper, it's easy because it's just me and the paper. No questions, you know, you don't have to face anything. It's so easy. But, but in reality, gosh, I just <laughs> don't think I'd want to be Fiona's friend. I don't know. You're the writer. You wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> I'd, I'd be too scared. You, you know, I, I would have to watch what I say because she literally would say, oh, let's do it. It's like, oh, my God, I would kill him. <laughs> but oh, oh, and then Fiona might say, let's do it. I'll think of something. But yeah, so eventually Eve did it. Eventually she left that house where she didn't want to be Mrs. Deltasham. She didn't want to be John's wife. She wanted to get away from Sebastian, who was forcing himself on her, but they've got a history together. 
So he wasn't being pervy. It's because of the backstory, the history that they had. Ah, in the first scene where we had even Sebastian and Sebastian was saying, I really love you and, and let's do something about it. And she's like, no, I am married to John. It's not going to happen. Um, and then she had the awkward, obviously, relatives, the mother-in-law, Vanessa was a sister-in-law. And, you know, she was acting the whole time. She was trying to be someone else to, to keep it together. But then I suppose Fiona called her up on it and maybe that, that was the right thing to do. Maybe not. But I hope it made sense to everyone. I think that's really the bottom line here. I could ramble yeah. on and talk about this play so much. Yeah, it was just, as long as the scene made sense, I think that's it. I, I, I think the, you know, the scene by itself made sense because I had a memory of what the first scene was. It was just, I didn't remember all these other characters from before, but now you're explaining that this is not like, it's not the next scene, it's, it's it is the end. It. It's the end. Yeah. Yeah. So and a lot of things happen in between. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. And I thought that maybe by choosing the end scene, it sort of encapsulates all that has happened. Okay. Maybe there are untold scenes there because I haven't shared them with you, but I'm hoping you can sort of fill in the gaps. Sure. What do yeah. you think for your, your main character now, Eve, would you want the audience to, um, feel for her to to uh support her or now are they going to look at her and say you know she could have just walked away if she wanted to get away she could have just walked away she didn't have to accept the fact that her friend has now killed off these people for her so now you've got a different feeling about eve that she's accepting this and she's just leaving she's just driving no, you, away you are absolutely right because the question of should we feel sorry for her? No, I think she made the wrong decision. Totally. Mm. I, I honestly, honestly think she made the wrong decision. And with the conversations behind the scenes that she may have had with Fiona. Yeah, I, I like I say, I would never have a friend like that. And I think the fact that she ran away from her responsibility. I suppose I address mental health here her mental health and how she she is finding it so hard to be her true self right. she's married someone that she she only married because she didn't want to marry sebastian because there's a bit of history there but she's made all the wrong decisions because she she's always been running away and I suppose when you're always running away, you make bad decisions. Yeah. And I think rather than making a bad decision, you know, show up, take responsibility. And Eve did not because Fiona took over. Because if you allow someone else to take over, I suppose you're helping them live their reality more than yours. And I suppose this is where Eve, yeah. So in answer to your question, no, I don't feel sorry for her. I think she was irresponsible. And I know I wrote it. <laughs> Any other uh, comments? I would love it if she didn't get in the car at the end and we just were left questioning, does she get in the car? Leslie, I just want to Good angle. Her. I'm not laughing at you. I'm laughing because we had this exact discussion in rehearsal. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I'm laughing because someone else noted it. We talked about it. Yeah. Good angle. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. So many possibilities. What if she doesn't get in the car? What if she goes back into the house and changes her mind? Or, or we just are left wondering because Fiona's yeah. just, you know, admitted <laughs> framing, murder. There's all these things that have just happened that are pretty Intense. catastrophic. Yeah. And um, it's not just necessarily a, a series of bad decisions. We're talking murder. And then at the end, she gets into the car. So she's almost condoning that. Um, and I would like to see her struggle a little bit more. Um, even if she eventually makes that decision. Um, yeah. I think it's interesting for the audience to be left with the question of 
you know, where her mind is at the end of all of this. Mm. Like instead of her getting in the car, maybe you do a close up of her looking back at the house, looking at the car, and then the scene ends. She doesn't really get yeah. in the car. Yeah, that, yeah, that would work. Yeah, 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 yeah. That would definitely work. Yeah, or, and or, it, it leaves everyone guessing. Yeah. Or for me, that maybe she gets in the car, but there's a consequence for her to get in the car, and maybe there's something that is it, Felona. Fiona. Fiona has something to hold over her and Eva realizes, okay, I've gotten out of one situation where I wasn't controlling my life. Now I'm in another one. You know, that maybe there's a consequence there for accepting this happening. I suppose thinking it through, okay, great angle. If she, if she, she, where Fiona says, I think, what was the last line? Can you fucking cheer up? Sorry about the swearing. Anyway, can you fucking cheer up and get in the car? And then we end the scene there. And I suppose she leaves it as a question. Or, or maybe Eve says, perhaps that she's not sure what she wants to do. I suppose getting going back into the house means she has to take a lot of responsibility, bearing in mind that Fiona is leaving the scene. And for someone who is so used to running away, I don't think she'd want to go back into the house. So, yeah. and, and I don't think Fiona would let her go back into the house because that means Fiona might... It will implicate... Get, well, she's yeah. obviously... Yeah. yeah. We yeah. did talk about that in rehearsal. I had wanted... Tasman, can I say quickly my perspective of what went on um what i was taking away from it sure 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 sure. fiona i was saying she wouldn't force her into the car but if there was that moment of hesitation fiona she would be keeping she'd keep track of it she'd be keeping track of everything that was going on in her head and i watch a lot of fatal attraction movies it's not how i live my life i like the movies that's it that's all and with those characters, there's a consequence to everything. And there's a lot of reasons why the movies usually end with the fatal attraction women dying. I, it, you know, I can go on about it forever, but there are reasons why the movies end the way that they do. And with, like, Fiona doesn't like being questioned. She doesn't like it that she's not being able to gloat. And that is definitely coming it's up. And she didn't start out this way at all. If, if and, her friend didn't get in the car and if her friend told her, you know, the cops, oh, all of these things happened, that is when we would see a consequence. Yeah. And I think during our discussion in the breakout room, I think you brought up something really interesting where would Eve end up being another victim? Would it be that bad where Fiona wants to cover her tracks so desperately? Would she turn on Eve? I don't know. Well, she, I it, really it, don't would, know. it would take a lot. Well, see, that's why yeah. I think uh, for me. It would be interesting to see that progression. Um, for yeah, me, if there's a moral issue with Eve accepting everything, then there has to be something that Fiona holds over her as a threat. Herself. And again, it's saying, okay, you've gotten out of one controlled life, but you're in another one now. And, and, and I then you just having I to accept look at all the people that, I friend. I could easily take you out, even though I did this for you. I could take you out if I really needed to. Or I've left some evidence that if you change your mind, it's going to point towards you. Oh, yes. I, yeah. 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 So get I in the car. <laughs> get in the car. I'm giggling because I'm having a wonderful time talking about some of my favorite plot devices. Yeah. I'm sorry, I don't mean to be monopolizing the discussion of your play. <laughs> no, 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 that's cool. Now, any discussion, any feedback is welcome. And then uh, later on, I go away and think, did it make sense to me? What worked? What worked? What didn't work? Et cetera, et cetera. It's all part of the part of the writing cycle, isn't it? But yeah, everything is helpful and so many angles. Sure. Because I sometimes, I sometimes, I think with, with that play, I wanted to end it somewhere 
where Eve, we would question, like you say, should we feel sorry for Eve? The answer is no. And she made, she made some very bad decisions. And I think that's what I really wanted to highlight. She made some very bad decisions. But thank you. Yes, everything is very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. For thank you for bringing it in. Thank you for the opportunity, Stephen. Thank sure. you. Sure. Mr. Rex McGregor. <laughs> I I understand there's some congratulations for you. Your uh, well, the the bouquet script that that Paul read last month. You entered into another festival and it got accepted. Yeah, it's just oh. been it's just been produced in New York in a yes. small off Broadway theater. Off oh, Broadway, well done, well done. brilliant, great, brilliant. So it's going to be a live performance. Uh, it's just the season just finished, so it started on Thursday. It's just finished. Great, congratulations! Brilliant. Yeah, congratulations! Oh, how exciting! So, how did you feel about our reading for the uh, top seed and the poor seedling? Oh, we had a lot of fun doing this because we had a lot of rehearsal time, far more than we usually do. So yes. I think we got through it three and a half times. I think <laughs> so. It was great because um, you know when you do the first read through, I find actors are just feeling their way into the script, and by the second read through, there's a lot more energy. And when we just add a few notes, and then by the third time, we were really you know firing. So I I was very impressed with the way that it that progressed. Good. Good. Any other, any other comments? I just thought they were going to work it out. I thought when he started talking about the brick wall, she was going. It was going to be the compromise. Okay, I'm I'm fine. Don't build a brick wall. I won't cut down my tree. You keep your fence. You know, it's like it's the better of the two evils or something like that. Yeah. I enjoyed the role reversal here. So, yeah. so you know, the, the role reversal, you know, how you all uh, being so nice and neighborly and then it gets a bit catty and then it's like, oh, you're the leaves. And that, I think that got me and that was so hilarious when he was saying, oh, you're leaves, come <laughs> over to mine. And then I, I think, it, was it, um, uh, oh, sorry, I can't remember the character's name, but anyway, she was saying, well, it's the wind. <laughs> 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 so blame the wind oh it's not the wind but it's just neighbors do odd things and i think this was a hilarious piece yeah and and i i uh, that actually had an experience like that personally when we were living in california there was this what i thought was this beautifully shaped eucalyptus tree that was growing in our neighbor's backyard but of course, eucalyptus, they shed everywhere. And both my wife and our neighbor kept complaining about it. And basically, they forced the guy in the backyard to cut that tree down. And to me, it was just this beautiful shaped tree. It had beautiful shade. And it was like, it, I was out of it, though. I, I, my, my vote didn't count. So <laughs> they cut it down. Yeah. But I understand the woman that played uh, Catwoman in the Batman series, had the same problem with trees in her yard and some other actor that was living next to her kept complaining about her trees and she wouldn't do anything about them. It was like, no, these are my trees. I'm, gonna, I'm not cutting them back. So it happens. It does. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that yeah, definitely. So Daniel, were you... In uh, any of our previous readings? Last month, um, I did two. Oh, great. Okay. Um, I forget at the moment the two plays, but um, yes, I was, uh, anyway, I was in two. But this one was really cool. I mean, yeah. definitely gave me permission to be a little obnoxious and catty yeah. um, and delusional because I, I <laughs> If you ask my partner, that's me on a regular basis. Yeah. But no, and 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 Goretti was was awesome. She she played that neighbor. Yeah. 
Yes. Just, just borderline Karen without really yes. getting it. It's yes. Really cool. Yes. Awesome. I'm going to start with being friendly, but if that doesn't work, I'm going to let you have it. And, 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 <laughs> and I'm not and giving Rex, you back the ball. <laughs> I like that Rex was able to introduce just enough uh, Italian to, to make it like this is who I am, but not to the obnoxious point and let the dialogue make him obnoxious. So that was pretty cool. Um, I enjoyed it. And Goretti, I just met her today. She was awesome to play with. So sure. great. Yes. Likewise, Daniel, likewise. Yeah, yeah. And the props were great too. You know? <laughs> <laughs> the tennis trainer. <laughs> oh, wow. Amazing. In times of need, you know, this is the poor man. When are they going on sale? <laughs> I'm going to put the name right there, Franco. Uh, <laughs> I both thought it was absolutely hilarious and a wonderful prop because it worked. The physical yeah. work you were putting into it, it mm. fit. You didn't have to say, oh, he's playing tennis. We got mm -hmm. it. With the yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and then it was a, in my family, that would be a sugar strainer, like confectioner <laughs> sugar. And that's why I was laughing so much because I thought, oh, you, you know, you're going to end with the show and then you're going to go home and make French toast with that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I can play tennis and make pasta. So there you go. <laughs> yeah, I, I thought this was fun. I mean, the, the ones that I did last month were, were totally cool and, and so dramatic. And this was just a nice turn be silly for a little bit uh, without being ridiculous which is really cool i remember yeah. seeing you in something i don't know what the play is but you were acting against someone and i felt like crying and i was too embarrassed to say anything oh the yeah. one last month yeah that was really good um, um i'm so glad you know the one that i'm talking about because neither of us can explain it but we both know the yeah, one that we're talking I, about. I you know oh, we, what's her name it's on YouTube. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I just realized that. By the way, yeah, I just I just found it. I was like, whoa, there I am. Um, <laughs> but no, uh, Rex's writing was really cool. It, it, it just gives you permission to play back and forth with each other. And sure. um, I find it really cool how it's going to sound so cocky, but when you've done enough, like you find a new partner to dance with, and you just find each other's steps. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. You, already got to lead and then I got to lead and, and it's just really cool. So. Yeah. Good performances. This is this is me subliminally saying I'm a professional folks. <laughs> what? <laughs> I've done, I've done this kind of thing before. Vote, and I had to clarify that I'm a professional and wouldn't make sure anyway. Uh, what yeah. I liked about the writing was and I didn't pick up on it until Rex said it in the room. Uh, was that it's written like a like a volleying of of uh, yeah. tennis? Like I didn't yeah. pick that up, although I could feel the rhythm was like bup 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 bup. But since I don't play tennis, I guess I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I love that that the writing is you know. Yeah, we're all up. sitting like this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, and you know it's a, it's a really cool. I'm trying to sound all smart here, but it's a really cool. Rex did a wonderful job and we didn't need this like huge dialogues between each other to get the point across. For this particular play, it didn't need it. It just needed just the right words to kind of go, I'm going to be friendly, but I'm, I'm going to kick your butt. Um, so it, it was great. It was great. I, have, I had fun. Thank you for letting me play, Rex. Appreciate it. Sure. I'm sorry, folks, but I had a four o'clock call and she keeps texting me, get on the call, get on the call. Okay. So I gotta go. oh, Have a good uh, weekend, everybody. What's left? Thank you. Sure. We'll we'll thanks so you. much. Bye. I'll we'll see you next time. Bye, 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 bye. I guess we got our jump to Paul, his <laughs> monologue. Paul going to say something. Paul, did you have any discussion with the writer about that piece? No. No, I didn't. I I started to. Um, he sounded like he was so busy. He was he wasn't available several days in a row, and so I think that's maybe why I didn't. Okay. Yeah. But uh, yeah, normally I just prefer that the writer be there, but uh, yeah. particularly because we're going to have a discussion about his work, and we may say things that may be helpful. Yeah. Uh, and it's also it's nice to get you know his 
point of view as to where the writing is coming from. Uh, he he um, he had a lot of um, um, notes, uh, stage business. Okay. Uh, written between the lines, there was there was a lot of instruction. On the bottle to... too. Huh. A lot of instructions on the bottle too. <laughs> yeah. That bottle must kept getting bigger. I know. I had to. I had to get a big bottle <laughs> because uh, I thought, "Gosh, it 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 just too much if it was one of those tiny pill bottles." You know? Yeah. But it might be funnier <laughs> if there was that much text on a tiny pill bottle like that. I might have to get a magnifying oh, glass out. My, my only, my only. Uh, kind of direct response I had to it was I kept waiting for the ending and I kept thinking as an ending that you should take the pill out of the bottle, start to take it and then go, yeah, I feel better already. And, and, and put it away. Like, I'm not going to risk it. <laughs> I think the way in which you were reading it, it was like, by the way, Paul, you were very good. I was laughing out loud. I was I definitely was I, laughing yes. out loud. Oh <laughs> yes. my goodness me. Oh my goodness me. And and as you were reading it, sometimes here, you know, when you receive your medication, you get a leaflet with all the side effects. It's huge. Never read it. Um, <laughs> it's like, never read it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Never read it because you will, you will probably develop uh, a, another condition without even knowing. Um, and as you were going through it, the pain you were feeling was absolutely amazing because you were going, and, and as you were reading the list and I thought, oh my goodness me, that is awful. And when you got down to, I think the bowel issues, I think that really made me laugh. Oh my goodness me. Oh my goodness me. But yeah, like Stephen said, when you got to the end, maybe if you popped the lid i mean th this would be obviously for the writer you pop the lid you go should i take one or should i take two and as stephen said no i feel better already yeah yeah that were that works but the way in which you read it that was brilliant yeah yeah, yeah kudos yeah. to you that was really good yeah yeah okay. and and at no point did i feel that okay uh, i can guess what's going to come up next i had no clue and I think that's that's what I liked yeah. about it. There was no clue yeah. as to what were you going to read next. Ex especially saying, and don't eat persimmons. I'm going, don't <laughs> <laughs> they're supposed to be healthy. <laughs> they're healthy fruits. <laughs> but yeah, I did I thought, enjoy um, it. Sorry. Go ahead, no, I was, I was going to say that I thought, and obviously you didn't get a chance to, to talk to Erwin over or play with it at all or have a director but i thought maybe when in rehearsal you can play around with what if this guy is a total hypochondriac as, as another angle and Start as he's sweating. reading these symptoms <laughs> he starts getting all the yeah, things he's talking yeah, about yeah he's getting them <laughs> as he reads them <laughs> psychosomatic yeah. exactly yeah yeah <laughs> You know, I saw you do the breath thing, checking your breath. And then I was like, well, what if what if it escalates as you keep going? You know, like, you know, the gas and the, you know, and the other stuff happening, you know. Oh, my goodness me. Yeah. You know, he finally he, he realized it, it actually says it on the bottle that there's no cure. <laughs> that it's it's fatal and that there's. It's really senseless to do anything. <laughs> so, um, and you uh, mentioned death at the end, and it was so funny because when you mentioned that, you uh, the advice was to ring a number, and I thought if you're dead, you can't <laughs> ring anyone. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it was hilarious. You know, part of my, one of my day jobs is uh, cancer advocate. So I do a lot of work with pharmaceutical companies and I just came back from a cancer conference. And as I was walking by the vendors, reading all of this stuff, it sounded like the stuff that I was reading this weekend. So I was having a little bit of a, a 
PTSD from all the information that I got. Uh, <laughs> I was being a little triggered by it, but it totally sounds like conversations that I have with like my advocate friends. Like we sit around and make fun of that. It's like, if you're allergic to this pill, don't take it. I'm like, how are you supposed to know if you don't even? Right, right. Yeah. right. So, great job. Great job. It sounded like I was yeah. one of my conferences. So good job on that. <laughs> yeah, there's, a, there's a joke. I think it's Byron Allen who tells it. Well, there's a few variations on it. But I think Byron Allen's version of um, if you have an erection lasting more than four hours, he's like, call Harry Barry. <laughs> <laughs> Celebrate. <laughs> <laughs> so our, 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 our next one, instead of going to, um, I can't even remember the name of my own, um, Second Chance, uh, we'll go to Martin's, but Martin has left. So we have Leslie here. I'm here to represent. And and Ava has gone also, right? Yeah. 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 You know, I, I read that script. I got more out of it hearing it than than reading it, and and I think you guys did a really good job about it, and and it might have helped the fact that I did read it before, so I kind of knew what was what was what was going on, uh, but I I did enjoy it more hearing it performed. But you guys did a good job. Yeah, definitely. Was Martin in the room with you when you were uh, rehearsing? Yes, uh, only by voice because his camera wasn't on. But yeah, we could we could talk back and forth a little bit. Yeah. Did he have any suggestions or feedback for you? Um, just uh, it was he liked a lot of the stuff we were doing, and we actually had some questions mm -hmm. for him. You know, I was asking about um, you know, how he wanted it played, if he wanted you know to to really. Um, at one point, before we had somebody else playing the other role, I said, well, if you want to put this up and there's no one else, I could play both parts. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> you know, but he said that would give it away way too soon. I mean, the whole point is that last line that, right. you know, I mean, we talk about the split all the way through. Yeah. But you don't really know that they're, you know, this character is locked up in, a, in an asylum uh, until the very end and has a split personality. Um but yeah, it, I just wanted to know if he wanted to be such a distinct split, you know, because my character is kind of mean to my other half. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I said, I don't want to play it, obviously, one note. So I wanted to start, you know, he said, you can start with we, both of us going back and forth with the corrections. And then it builds and builds and builds, you know, until you really see the distinct personalities coming out of the same person. The thing is, is that I know that the other parts that you've done here, you're able to change your appearances enough that I think you could have pulled it off. I'm just not sure how we could have done it in the editing that um, unless you did the parts separately and then we were able to kind of put two images together at the same time. But I, I think you could have pulled it off. That would have been cool. Yeah. yeah. Because even in the reading and even even in this performance, I assume it was still two people and they were both in a mental institution. Mm. I, yeah. I it never occurred to me it was the same person. Yeah, the whole the whole thing is it's a split a split personality. The whole the whole uh, story, the whole character is is split. We asked about the origins of the writing, you know, and he said that he was given. Um, I guess a writing exercise to talk about um, two, something with two or, and uh, then the, the idea of twins came up to him. And then he thought, well, what if it's the twins are actually one person with a split personality? Mm -hmm. And so uh, I thought that was fascinating. Does anybody know if it's, if it's possible for a woman to carry two fertilized eggs that have been fertilized by two different people? Yeah, it is you, possible. It's, it's very rare. rare. It is, but it's extremely rare. Yeah. 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 Very rare. But we asked, well, that was one of the things we discussed in the rehearsal as well. Uh, and I believe that the woman would have to have, it, the way that Martin explained it, was that the woman would have to be with two different men within a, about a 24 hour period. Yeah. Very quick. And, and that it's rare, but it does happen. Yeah. 
that heteropaternal is is an actual thing. Okay. Result of a menage a trois. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But is that isn't be, even that would be within the same time period? Yeah, the two two sperms <laughs> racing to get the two different eggs. <laughs> Sorry, I was just going to say, isn't the human body fascinating and what it's capable of? Yep. It's fascinating. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I think he should definitely try the piece using the same actress and completely with completely different different appearances. Yeah, I, I think it would, it would be interesting. And then maybe merge them at the end. That's cool. Yeah complex but cool yeah eve white and eve black yeah, yeah. there you go <laughs> remember the three faces of eve yeah um anything before we move on to the last one mm -hmm. and that was with bob and james they did a great job considering the time that we had to put it together yeah appreciate yeah, it yeah. definitely how did you guys feel about it I, I thought it was good. Um, I, I was glad I had an overcoat and a, uh, a fedora to, yeah. to throw in there. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think you guys did both characters very well and played off of each other as completely different people. Yeah. Good. Yeah, I think the second that second read through that we did, um, I think my partner was a little smoother than he was, of course, on the first cold reading. Yeah. Yeah. So. I think yeah, you got to kind of get used to the dialogue. Yeah. How'd you feel, James? <clears throat> I felt like by the time we did it, I started to get a sense of it. So, if, you know, I had a couple more times. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I feel like that maybe um, I, if I were, if it were to, we were to continue on it, you know, differentiate the two characters more um so just rougher and yeah you know um more distinctive but um i i started to get a sense of it as you know sure but it was pretty cold so you know i felt good about it considering yeah good thank you thank you i really couldn't i really couldn't tell i would have i would have assumed that there were different triggers towards their calling each other by name each of them knew what name they liked to go by right. and which one they didn't right. and i right. didn't see anything particular in the dialogue that would cause my character to specifically call him something other than benny you know it's not like he said something something was said to him that he would go back to benjamin um right. that was a, a, a trigger in there normally there would be something that would say you know when your character gets upset you're going to call him benjamin because you know he doesn't like that just right. like he's going to call you, he's going to call you Chuck. Yeah. And you don't want that. But I didn't see a trigger, specific trigger in the, in the dialogue to do that. Well, Which I is, think Benjamin starts it by calling you Chuck from the very beginning. Yeah. yeah and I, and, and I call him Benjamin at the very beginning. And he doesn't like Benjamin. Right. And I don't like Chuck. So. Right. Right. <laughs> right. But, and then, but, and then at another point when he's trying to get something from you, he says, Charles. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. But you've already had enough of him, so you're 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 calling him back to, Benjamin. Back to Benjamin, yeah. Because you know he hates it. But it was interesting that that whole element was first um, given to the audience, through, well, given to us as um, viewers through the stage directions. So I was wondering, you know, in a in a movie, you don't have that luxury. So right. it might have been a, a bit trickier to play. Yeah, and for I, the I think, to catch on that that's what was happening. Yeah, I, I there were a lot of directions in there that I normally wouldn't have read, but because it's this Zoom environment and they're not getting up and moving around, I I I, I thought it might be necessary to at least describe those moments. And you're right, if if we were on stage or filming it, that that narration wouldn't be there at all. Yeah. Mm. Kind of have to approach it a little differently with, with Zoom. So, 
So is everybody done? I think it was, um, I think the whole discussion about time was fascinating. Yeah. I really enjoyed that. I really enjoyed that section about, you know, if time is real or not. Mm -hmm. And um, I enjoyed the performances a lot too. You know. Uh, and I, I, yeah, kind of, I, I kind and of I was wondering if you know what is what is the detective's um, relationship to the body, but I guess we find that out later on. But left me wondering. What know. what happens in the story as he continues to investigate? He finds his life going back in time. Mm. And each time he tries to do something to continue the investigation, he keeps going back further and further in time. And, and he's the only one that's aware of it. Nobody else knows it's going around until he gets to the precinct. And Vernon Jules walks into the precinct demanding help to find his daughter. Uh, I love that. Yeah, that's his second chance. Interesting. Okay. And I kind of sprinkled time throughout it, like uh, Detective Turbulon, I was explaining. Turbulon is a device and very expensive watches that works off of the gravitational pull, keeps the watch running and keeps it on time. And then you have Benjamin Dial, Dial being like, you know, Dial. Dial of a watch, yeah. Or a sundial. Yeah. So, and you've got Jules Verne, who wrote, you know, time travel. Right. Yeah. So, I like oh, playing with that. What happened to the daughter? You know, I can't remember the daughter's name now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess we, we've got another month. I, what, what I'd like to suggest to any actors out there, we don't always have to do original material. If you have a piece that you would like to perform in, you know, a, a well-established piece, if, and, and you maybe have another actor that you want to work with, propose that. As long as it's within that 10-minute time period, if that's what you want to do. Or if you have something that you want to perform, but don't feel like you can write it, then contact one of the writers and, and work together with them to write something for you. Is this every um, last Sunday in the month? Every every fourth Sunday. Every fourth, okay. Yeah. And it's not always the last one. I well, gotcha. Yeah. It's, it's not always the last one. The fourth <laughs> Sunday of each month. Yeah. 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 I saw something recently. Um, maybe somebody else saw it. It was um, it was a competition where you submit a monologue, and it could be original work or it could be a um, you know a classic monologue. And I uh, did anybody else see that on Facebook? I, I've. Uh, I have a friend who entered one. He got pretty far in the competition. Uh -huh. uh, I think that was last month. Uh, uh huh. Yeah, it was recently, and I was thinking it would be interesting to have an original. I mean, I'm not a writer, I've, I'm, but um, it would well, be interesting actually, to have an original monologue to to do. I actually started writing by doing monologues and performing them. So, if if you want to look at one, I can send you one. Okay. All right. Oh, I'll send you. Okay, there's a like a over 162 scripts out there, and I can't always remember their names. Uh, Let me bet it. Shoot, I I have one that I'm thinking of that I'll send you. Okay. okay. Thank you. Sure. And I've got I've got some too, um, Paul. So um, if you if you've got the details, I mean, I you you remember? Did you do the horse in Flight of the Cows? I yes. A horse. So that that character has his own monologue. Oh. <laughs> it's called um, Carriage Horse something. Yeah. Okay. I can't remember the title. All right. 
Yeah, yeah I'd this, like to see that. that yeah, that, that monologue started before the, I mean, I wrote the monologue before I wrote the play. So I added the character from the monologue into the play about the cows. Uh -huh. yeah, I'll send it to you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So Tasman, will you have something new to bring in next month or some, or another part of your script or? Yeah, she'll have 30 I, think I, I would relish the opportunity and I think I have something in mind. Um, I will do it. And then you can all tell me if it's any good. I think, yeah, I'll just throw myself in there. Shall I go into the deep end? Um, it's one that I wrote last year and it's called The Crowned Craziness of His Majesty's Matrimonial Fancy. Wow. That's so, a good script, huh? That's a long title for it. <laughs> it, it is a long title. And you know what? The moment it came into my head, I was like, should I change it? And I'm like, no, 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 don't change it. Something in here. Like, no, don't change it. I know it's long, but don't change it. So I didn't. Um, and it's about this king. Um, he's preparing for his fifth wedding. His mother's going crazy because she doesn't want him to get married again because it's just too much hassle. It's just too much pressure. And um, he has a kingdom. <laughs> um, it's obviously a fictitious island and he, you know, there are certain needs and, you know, about defense, security, intergovernmental alliances, et cetera, et cetera. And all he is concerned about is his pet llama. you know and his wedding obviously um so yeah maybe if we were to do how many pages are we allowed again uh, about 10. 10 yeah we try about not 10. to go over 10 10's good 10's good isn't it yeah, yeah. 10's good yeah. sometimes they say eight okay yeah. so if i upload that for next month i mean how soon can i do that as soon as you want oh, brilliant yeah. So if I, yeah, if I, yeah, if I upload that, uh, I won't be doing it right now because I am going to go to bed. But yeah. if I do that tomorrow, yeah. hopefully, yeah, then uh, then everyone can tell me next month what they thought of it or if it was too strong. And, and for me, it actually works out better if they're posted sooner because then we don't have what happened today. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Sure, 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 sure. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, Tasman, about writing something 365 days of the year. Oh, yeah. Ray Bradbury said that he would write something new every day. And he oh. said, if I write 365 stories in a year, I should have at least one good story. <laughs> That's the idea. That's the idea, because even though I'm going to write 365 plays, right. half of them, I'm pretty sure when I will read them at a later point, I will think, <laughs> well, what was this? Where was this going? Right. I don't know where this was going. And the other half, I'm hoping, will be okay and acceptable. But, you know, when we did this in uh, Australia last week, no, the week before, and we did it in London as well, some of the shorter ones, um, they were well received and I was, you know, pleasantly surprised because, you know, when you sit and you write so much, it works in your head so well. And when you read it and the actors bring it to life, then you might go, oh, OK, mm, not too sure about this. Mm. But it works. It works. And maybe the, the 10 minute limit, the actual 10 minute restriction, I think works really well because... Perhaps I stop at a point where it doesn't go sour. I kind of save myself from it turning ugly. So perhaps that works. But, you know, who knows? When I get to, I don't know, July, August, who knows? I probably would have lost my mic by then. Who knows? <laughs> and I'll be like, why did I make myself do this? Right. Why do I do this to myself? But anyway, I'm enjoying it so far. Good. But... Good. But you're happy for me to just um, upload that the the play that I've mentioned, the, the that scene, yeah, and then um, yeah, we'll go from there. Oh, I'm already excited. 
You're already good. excited about okay, it. Okay, good. Thinking good. about good. it, good. what you're going to read, and you're like, oh my God, what does she write? <laughs> okay. Great. Lovely. So hopefully we'll see everybody in a month. See you next month. Okay. Stay safe, everyone. Have a wonderful well. month. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.